This is Black Agenda Radio, a weekly hour of African American political thought and action. Welcome to the radio magazine that brings you news, commentary, and analysis from a Black Left perspective. I'm Glenn Ford, along with my co-host, Nellie Bailey. Coming up, a new book lays out the real relationship between the police and Black America. It's titled, Your Enemy in Blue. A new and deeper look at Eleanor Bumpers, the black grandmother killed by New York City police 34 years ago, and a grandfather with a radio show, speaks up for the common people in Zambia, Southern Africa. But first, much of the world is appalled at the U.S. attempt to provoke a coup in Venezuela and to put opposition politician Juan Guaido in the presidency. In New York City, the December 12th movement demanded that the United Nations condemn Washington's violation of international law. Roger Wareham is a human rights attorney and a member of D12. Well, the basic articles of the UN Charter speak to peace among countries, because that's what the UN was set up for, and the sovereignty of countries. And... Article 2 in particular speaks to that there's no legal justification for the intervention in a sovereign state. And so the U.S. involvement in Venezuela itself violates the charter. It's, it's one of those things that is, a, is a, bottom, a baseline of the U.N., but it gets disregarded depending upon who's, who's doing that. And so... One of the things you don't get from listening or reading mainstream media is that the majority of the countries in the world have taken a stand against the U.S. intervention in Venezuela. I know in terms of U.S. media, they say, well, the United States and Canada and five or six Latin American countries in Europe, when you put all those countries together, they're probably less than 10% of the countries in the world. And so you can get a distorted image of what's going on. In the statement we made, we not only refer to just the clear violation of the UN Charter, but one of the provisions of the United Nations is for settlement of international disputes is the International Court of Justice, which is based in The Hague. And in our statement, we cite a case in 1986 when the United States when they were in the middle of trying to overthrow the Sandinista-led regime in Nicaragua, were caught interfering in one of their main ports, one of their main bays. And the International Court of Justice cited international law in terms of countries cannot intervene in the internal affairs of a sovereign country. They can't do it through military force. They can't do it through support of opposition elements. So if you, if you look at it and you look at exactly what the United States is doing, it's a violation. Back in 1986, the court found against the United States, the United States' position in terms of the court, since it really lacks any enforcement mechanism, was we're going to take our marbles and leave because we don't have to follow this because it was a decision that was not in the interest. And in it, it's much the same way the United States deals with all international institutions. When the International Criminal Court was set up in 1999, 2001, the United States was involved in all of the negotiations for setting up the court. It insisted that certain things be put in it, otherwise they wouldn't sign it. And then after all that was done, then the United States said, you know what, we're just kidding. We're not going to participate in it anyway, although they insisted other countries do that. So what's happening now in 2018 under Trump is a continuation of U.S. policy. It's just under it. its old wine in a different bottle. Trump has a different style, but it's really no different than what they did under Bush, what they did under Obama. The difference is that Bush's style is that we're not going to couch this in terms of democracy or anything. That will we'll throw out that fig leaf. But our real position is what Pompeo said, we want the oil. We believe that U.S. companies can produce the oil more efficiently and benefit U.S. interests. And then in the State of the Union, Trump said that not only the oil, but this is about discrediting, destroying socialism. 
And so that in our statement, which we put out before even the State of the Union, we said the two main points of the U.S. involvement in Venezuela is oil, control of the oil, not even control of the oil, and the destruction of socialism. And their own statements have verified that. And so that's why we think it's very important, particularly the black community, understand that this is not an issue that we can stand on the sidelines from and act like it doesn't affect us. It affects us in a very direct way in the, in the sense that Venezuela, over the years since President Chavez came to power and continuing under President Nicolas Maduro, provided subsidized oil and heating oil to poor communities, mainly us, around the United States. Things that are all, that the United States does not provide to its so-called citizens and residents, Venezuela did. They did the thing with the Caribbean, with Caribbean countries and several African countries, to their own detriment, because the loss of money that they sustained for subsidizing oil to our communities, to Caribbean communities, to African countries, could have been used to put into a fund to protect them against what they're facing right now. The fall in the price of oil, the manipulation of the market, the U.S. putting a hold on their bank accounts so that they can starve the economy. So we have to look at what's happening in Venezuela in the context of the United States wants control of the oil, the United States wants to overthrow a socialist leading economy, and that they will follow the prescription that they successfully used from 1973 in Chile when they wanted to overthrow the democratically elected regime of Salvador Allende, who was a socialist. And they took the position, their policy was, we're going to make the economy scream, and we're going to create such disruption and hardship for the people in that country that they will take it out on the government, as opposed to seeing really clearly who's causing it. And they created those conditions of a hardship and unrest and an act of manipulation by U.S. companies in terms of support for the military that led to the coup, the September 11th, as the first big September 11th coup in 1973 against the Salvador Allende regime that led to a 19-year dictatorship under uh, General Pinochet. So this, for them, is a tried-and-true formula. And it's important for black people, not only because Venezuela has been a friend to us and to people of African descent in African countries, but that we're very clear, those of us in the December 12th movement, are very clear that also on the U.S. agenda, and it's never been off the U.S. agenda, has been the question of Zimbabwe. That the United States, kith and kin to the British, have never forgiven Zimbabwe for just having the temerity and the audaciousness to take land from white people who had stolen the land from black people and return it to black people. And since they began that program of returning the land, seizing the land from whites and returning it to indigenous Zimbabweans in 1999 and 2000, the U.S. policy has been that we want regime change in Zimbabwe. We cannot allow an example like Zimbabwe to stand because it has repercussions, not only in Zimbabwe, which really represents no national security interests, any conceivable, no matter how they articulate security interests to the United States, but it was to the British, but the repercussions and the example that that set of taking the land back would have repercussions not only in Zimbabwe, but throughout the southern African region, particularly in South Africa, where the same situation existed in terms of there's a blacks hold political power, they have a flag, but they don't control the economy, and they certainly do not control the land. And we're seeing that happening now in South Africa, where President Ramaphosa has had to take a position that we're going to take the land back. And so there are numbers of reasons why black people have to be involved. The United States, of course, massively violates international law all the time with its regime change policy, but it seeks to create an exception on humanitarian grounds. And possibly that's why they're talking about this $20 million in humanitarian aid waiting at the border between Venezuela and Colombia. 
Well, you know, they play a game with humanitarian. It's the whole question of what's a humanitarian disaster. Because the United States has created the conditions that have forced some people to leave Venezuela. The United States has created the conditions that has led to the shortage of medicine and, and different necessities in Venezuela. The amount of money that the Venezuelans are losing because the United States has put a hold on their revenue is greater than the amount of humanitarian aid that they allegedly want to provide in Venezuela. So if they just lifted the, the sanctions, the, the illegal sanctions that they put on Venezuela, Venezuela would have more than enough money to be able to provide the necessities of life for their people. So they're playing a game on people. They've created the conditions. Now they say we want to alleviate the conditions. But the alleviation there that they are talking about is really a way for them to prop up and try and give credence to Guaido, whom 80% of the Venezuelan population didn't even know existed until a month ago, and then to give them a provocation to possibly launch a military intervention. So this is not the type of humanitarian crisis that's created by a natural disaster. This one is one that has been completely politically created and has been created in a way to affect this slow motion coup d'etat. Even a casual observer would note that the opposition in Venezuela is quite light and rich, while the support for the socialist government there is largely black and brown. Yes, the mainstream media in the United States will show the opposition rally. And if you looked at that, you would think that the majority of the population in Venezuela was white or, or very light-skinned. And then they don't really show the rallies in support of the government, which are massive. And when you see the rallies in support of the government, you will see that the population is black and brown. And that's why, that's one of the things that it, the government has so much support, because President Chavez was a, a mixture of African and indigenous Indian. And he always acknowledged that. He took pride in that. And the revenue that one of the things why the opposition hated President Chavez and President Maduro is that their policy was the profits that come from the oil are no longer going to be directed into the pockets of a few elite rich, already rich Venezuelans. We're going to use them to improve the quality of life of the masses of poor people who are black and brown. And you saw that in terms of improved housing, educational opportunities, jobs that were now open, the literacy rate increase, that were now open to the population which had existed in poverty for decades. And so it's similar to, you know, we do a lot of work, the December 12th movement does a lot of work at the United Nations. And we start, we'd been going to Geneva to the Human Rights Commission, which is called then, from 1989 to the present. And the Brazilian representatives were always white. So if you looked at the Brazilian representatives to the United Nations, you would think that Brazil was a white nation. And it wasn't until the World Conference Against Racism was on the agenda to come up that they then started putting black Brazilians as part of their delegation. So the optics are very important. And to understand why the Maduro government has that support, you have to understand that the, the masses of Venezuelans who are black and brown were the ones who benefited from the policies of Chavez and Maduro. And the ones who suffered, and I won't even use it, not suffered, because for them suffering was that they weren't able to rip off as much money as they did before President Chavez came to power, that that's what their beef is. Their beef is that they do not have access to unrequited, unaccounted for riches that they stole from the, the people of Venezuela, and they want to be back in power to control that. The United States' most notable allies in terms of its offensive against Venezuela are Brazil and Colombia. Brazil, with an outright fascist and racist now in the presidency, Bolsonaro, and Colombia, which once had the biggest internal displacement population in the world, largely consisting of black Colombians. True. In South America... Brazil and Colombia 
definitely. There's a resurgence of the right in South America. I mean, there had been a pushback after the dictatorships that were set up in the 1970s. And in the 1990s and in the early thousands, there had been a pushback. And then you had President Chavez, you had Evo Morales in Bolivia. And there was a whole push towards the left. And now you see a resurgence of the right. And they're really sort of circling and circling Venezuela and with the active involvement of the United States. And one of the points that, that people are really not clear about is that the displacement you talked about in Colombia, a lot of the people who were displaced from Colombia went to Brazil. So a lot of the people who are going across the border from Venezuela to Brazil, to, I mean to Colombia, are Colombians who are Colombian citizens. They're not necessarily Venezuelans. They came to Venezuela because of the policies of Chavez and Maduro that benefited people like them. And so the move towards the right that Trump represents in the United States, Cisse in, in Egypt, Duterte in, in the Philippines, you're seeing that in Central and South America, and that's what we have to look at in terms of what's happening in terms of trying to strangle and affect regime change in Venezuela. That was attorney Roger Wareham of the December 12th movement, speaking from New York City. The Black Alliance for Peace also condemns the Trump administration's regime change policy in Venezuela as a white supremacist assault disguised as a humanitarian intervention. The police are no friend to the black community in the United States, says author Christian Williams, who's written a new book. It's titled Our Enemies in Blue, Police and Power in America. The thing to understand about the title is that it represents a conclusion, not the premise. It's not the assumption that you should start with in order to understand the book. It is the conclusion that I hope the book will bring you to. And to make that argument, I look at the police as they've developed as an institution over the past couple of hundred years, um, originating sort of pre-modern policing institution called the slave patrols, which were specifically there for capturing escaped slaves and putting down slave revolts. And then I trace how that morphed into what's easily recognizable as a modern police force in Charleston, South Carolina, right around the time of the American Revolution. And the argument I make is that that initial racial and economic function of preserving white supremacy and disciplining the workforce has remained the key function of police forces since then. And I think methodologically where I start is with the assumption that in, if we're going to understand any institution, but in this case, the police, we need to look at what it actually does and not what it claims to be doing. And so the rhetoric about policing is very much they protect the innocent and catch the guilty and solve crimes and keep communities safe and all that kind of stuff. But if you look at how they actually perform, it turns out to have relatively little to do with justice or safety or even necessarily law enforcement. The law turns out to be a pretty weak indicator of how the police are going to behave in any given situation. What's a much more reliable indicator is the existing distribution of power in the society. And in our society, that means especially hierarchies of race and class. So in a sense, when the police are described as defenders of society, that's true. That is, they defend the existing social relationships and power relationships in society, white supremacy and the rule of the rich. That, that's exactly right. Well, it's interesting that, that that is true at basically every level of analysis. Like That's true if you look at the cop on the beat using his discretion to decide which laws to enforce, which people to deem suspicious and therefore stop and frisk, and when and how to use force. It's also true at the level of the institution as a whole and how it has changed and how, it, more importantly, I think, how it has remained very much the same over the course of a couple of hundred years, such that during the antebellum period, when slavery was in place, the police serve to preserve white supremacy by enforcing the laws around slavery. After that, when Jim Crow was in place, the police served to preserve white supremacy by enforcing the laws to maintain segregation. 
in the post-civil rights period, when legally there is equality, the police continue to preserve white supremacy, sometimes in ways that enforce the law and sometimes in ways that directly violate it. The, I mean, I think the conclusion that you have to reach is that the fact of racial stratification is more important in how they make their decisions than anything that the law specifically says. In fact, what we see actually happening historically is that after the turbulent decade of the 60s, when legal apartheid was defeated and supposedly black folks had full constitutional rights, the mass black incarceration regime is put into high gear and police get SWAT teams and such. Yeah. Toward the end of the book, I look at the two defining tendencies of policing in the last 40 years or so, those being militarization and community policing. And those are often presented as these two options. There's like the good option of community policing and the mean option of militarization. But what I found when I looked at the history is that both of those arose at the same period, and both of them were direct responses to the crisis of the 60s especially the civil rights movement. And in fact, they tend to arise in the same cities at the same time. And the the conclusion that I had to draw was that rather than representing two competing versions of policing, there are actually two complementary aspects to a single strategy. And the argument that I made initially with some trepidation, but as time has gone by, this has become more and more sort of the stated doctrine of the police themselves is that that combination of militarization and community policing represents a domestic application of counterinsurgency, that essentially the local security forces were looking to what the military was doing, especially at the time in Vietnam, and look for ways to apply those strategies inside the United States, especially in response to the civil rights movement. So how can we talk about reforming a system whose central mission is to control, terrorize, contain, and otherwise circumscribe the rights of a people? Well, the argument I make at the end of the book, the the last chapter is titled Making Police Obsolete. And there I argue that really no amount of reform is going to be enough for this institution. What we need is not better policing. What we need is something other than policing. We need to find other social arrangements that will do the things that we wish the police did more of, like preserve public safety, resolve disputes, that sort of stuff, and less of the things that the police do that we don't like, especially preserving the existing power structure. But I don't think that's going to take the form of better policing. I think that's going to have to be embodied in a completely different kind of institution. Now, that's not to say that in the meantime, while we have this institution of policing, that we don't have to engage in the hard work of trying to reform it. But it does mean that we need to be very careful about which reforms we pursue. And we want to pursue reforms that are going to overall have the effect of shifting power away from the police and toward the community. We want to avoid reforms that are going to have the effect of improving police or re-legitimizing them or giving them new tools, new weapons, broader latitude, more engagement with the community. That stuff is ultimately only going to prolong the lifespan of this institution that ultimately I think we need to be looking for ways to close down. But community control of the police certainly could be a bridge to that new kind of policing. The details here are going to be very important. What exactly we mean by community control. I mean, Starting in the 70s, and really probably peaking in the 90s, there was a big movement for civilian review boards. One of the things, which would be bodies of citizens that review complaints against the police, review the use of force, sometimes make policy recommendations, that sort of thing. One of the lessons of that period, I think, is that not all civilian review boards are, are the same, that some of them are merely a sort of legitimizing window dressing, and some of them have actual enforcement power. Even at their best, though, there's a limitation as far as how the community as a whole relates to this body of four or five representatives who have some civilian capacity of overseeing the police. 
That said, I think the, that struggle over civilian review boards was a very important one in that it did bring many thousands of people into a movement that was critically examining the police, calling the question the function of the police. Eventually, the sort of abolitionist perspective grew out of the limitations of that civilian review board movement. And the political fight and the forcing of the question of the legitimacy of the police, forcing the police in some ways to publicly answer for themselves, I think that had a very important effect, even if the specific reforms that came out of it were often sometimes lacking. The Black Panther Party began as a kind of cop watch, and we see cop watches proliferating around the nation. Could we look at these phenomenon as the prototypes of community self-policing? I think there's a possibility there, and the Panthers in particular are an interesting example. You know, most famously, they had armed patrols to see what the police were doing in the black community and to advocate for people who the police were hassling and also the always present threat that they would intervene if the police got out of line. But the Panthers also were concerned about crime in the black community. And they arranged things like a escort service for elderly people going about their business throughout the city so that they'd be accompanied by a party member if they were in a dangerous neighborhood and didn't feel safe, like going to the bank, going to the grocery store, that sort of thing. It also seems as the fact of the existence of the Black Panther Party diminished crime in the areas that it was active because it gave a productive outlet for other sorts of social frustrations. And so people who may have otherwise been drawn to gang life or criminality or that sort of thing instead became politically involved, which contributed overall to the sort of health and stability of the community. So by that line of reasoning, the best way or ultimately the most effective way to prepare a community for policing itself is through organized social protest and agitation. That lays the groundwork for people feeling a responsibility for that community and for implementing change in that community. I think that's right. And Specifically, places that have implemented non-state restorative justice or transformative justice models that rather than operating on a theory of sort of catching the bad guys and punishing them, instead try to mediate disputes and work toward repairing the harm done. The places where those models have been most successful, they've grown out of social movements and have depended on the social movements for their legitimacy. And the two examples that I've detail most thoroughly in the book are the Community Restorative Justice Program in Northern Ireland at the end period of the Troubles and the street committees in South Africa. And both of those arose really by necessity, where as legitimacy shifted from the state to the social movement, people started looking to the social movement to solve their problems. They started looking to the social movement to resolve disputes, to keep them safe. And as the police lost legitimacy and the resistance movement gained legitimacy, the responsibility for public safety naturally shifted. And to the degree that social movements are prepared for that shift, they're going to be better able to take that responsibility when that time arises. So to the degree that folks struggle against state power and therefore against the police who defend the power of the state, they are laying the political groundwork for the abolition of the police. Well, I sure hope so. You write, while we may not be able to fix policing, it might be possible to abolish it. What gives you confidence in that statement? Well, there's a pretty straightforward historical argument, which goes like this. The police, as the institution that we have right now, haven't always been there. They arose at a particular moment in history in response to specific social conditions. That suggests that as history advances and as those social conditions change, it should also be possible to eliminate that institution, to replace it with something better. To be more specific, the police rose arose specifically in the defense of white supremacy and to discipline the labor force. If we can make the political changes necessary to 
toward equality and against an exploitative economy, then we should be able to create social conditions where that institution would no longer have a role. Sounds like a revolution to me. Me too. That was Christian Williams, author of Our Enemies in Blue, Police and Power in America. 34 years ago, Eleanor Bumpers was killed by police in her public housing apartment in the Bronx, New York. The cops that shotgunned the grandmother to death claimed she threatened them with a kitchen knife. Bumpers became a symbol of police disregard for black lives. LaShawn Harris was a child in that Bronx neighborhood when Bumpers was cut down in 1984. Harris is now an associate professor of history at Michigan State University. She recently published a comprehensive study of the life and times of Eleanor Gray Bumpers in the political journal Souls. The article is entitled Beyond the Shooting, Eleanor Gray Bumpers, Identity Erasure, and Family Activism Against Police Violence. I think it's important to look at, number one, the variation of violence that Black people in general face, and Black women in particular. As I was doing research on Eleanor Bumpers, I found cases where African-American women, Hispanic women, and even Asian-American women in New York City during the 70s and during the 80s were not only not just killed by the police, but also on a daily basis, their encounters with police, whether it be in the streets, at home, or on their job, were verbally, sexually, and physically assaulted. So the killing of of Black women or or racial and ethnic quote-unquote minorities was one thing, but I found countless cases of everyday police violence. So I think we tend to forget about, right? Because sometimes, and rightfully so, sometimes the focus is on those victims who, those victims who have died. The second piece, the second piece of this is I think it's also important to humanize those who were killed by the police. The reason why I did this article on bumpers was because I wanted to go beyond what we had heard about her, what had happened in that apartment on October 29th, 1984. I wanted to understand who she was, and I wanted to understand the impact of her death on her family and the community. So the piece starts off with this violent encounter with the police, and it ends with her funeral. But throughout the piece, I'm talking about humanizing her, which I think is really important to studying the different ways in which people encounter the police. It's just not enough to talk about what has happened to them, but I really wanted to understand who they were beyond what we had heard about them in the media. It's important to talk to family members, to understand the lives that they led before that horrific uh, encounter. And I also think it's important that we don't freeze people in time to one particular horrific moment in their lives. Like Eleanor Bumpers, Sandra Bland, Oscar Grant, they were more than newspaper headlines. They were more than police shooting victims. Like they were people, right? They had families um, who loved them. So I was interested in looking at that aspect of her life. So I, I, again, I, I believe that Black Lives Matter is an important movement, but I wanted to really understand who she was. And again, this is a personal story for me, as someone who's from New York, who grew up in the Bronx, and who lived across the street from Eleanor Bumpers. Yes, in many ways, you seem to have seen this, the Eleanor Bumpers story, as part of the tale of Black migration from the South to New York, and the extreme difficulties encountered in both places. Yes, and I think sometimes when we talk about migration, We talk about the different ways in which African-Americans find themselves, Southerners find themselves in these new urban spaces, and that they're coming up for jobs and opportunities, um, et cetera, et cetera, and they imagining the possibilities, like new possibilities in these urban spaces. So with Bumpers, I really wanted to understand why she was migrating from Franklin County 
North Carolina to New York City. And she was in part migrating because like many of those migrants who come from the South and make their way up to Detroit or Chicago or New York, she's coming for a new economic opportunity. But she's also coming because prior to her leaving North Carolina, she had been imprisoned. She had been imprisoned for about eight months and was looking to leave Lewis, uh, Lewisburg, Franklin County, Lewisburg, which is a small town in North Carolina. She wanted a new, fresh start. The other reason that she may have been leaving North Carolina, and I found this out through oral history, was because she had a love interest who was also migrating at that time. And this may or may not have been her one opportunity to leave North Carolina. So for her, migration wasn't just about the possibility of economic opportunity, better housing, possibly, you know, better treatment. But this is about leaving a really complicated past and starting a new life with a new love interest. So migration, in other words, was not easy for her. It wasn't an easy choice. And her adjustment to New York City definitely was not easy. In the reporting at that time, we learned that Eleanor Bumpers had been imprisoned. The police made a lot about that. And that she had psychiatric problems, which the police used to somehow justify killing her. But you saw, in fact, in those details of her life, a story about social oppression. And a lot of this stuff I don't have access to. To. Um, her prison record in North Carolina, prison record, prisoners' records in North Carolina are closed to the public. Um, I understand, I know what she went to jail for. I don't know the circumstances. She went to jail for assault. But for Black women in the 1930s, 1940s, assaulting somebody could have meant a lot of different things. I mean, she could have been assaulted by someone in her family, a man, or she could have been assaulted by a white man. She was a domestic worker at a hotel in Lewisburg. So she could have been uh, responding to violence that was being inflicted upon her. I have no record of that because the records are closed, but that was used against her to kind of part of the, the larger smear tactic. And we see that now happening with police shooting victims, a smear tactic of the kind of dirtying the victim up, right? And by dirtying the victim up, it means that there's less culpability on the state, the carceral state, the police, and the demise of that person, it's all on them, that they were responsible for their own deaths. So the same thing is happening with bumpers, this smear tactic. The mental illness records, again, I don't have access to those records, but allegedly, allegedly, she was schizophrenic. And I'm on the fence with that because I haven't seen those records. Um, I've interviewed her daughter several times and they see her mental illness in various different ways. But again, I think it bolsters the argument that she was a danger to herself and she was possibly a danger to the men who came through that door on October 29th, 1984. But again, it's part of this larger campaign to kind of resurrect historical images of Black people as dangerous or crazy. This justifies the violent treatment and inhumane treatment against her. Because if the police officers would have came through that door and saw an elderly white woman, perhaps, the situation could have possibly been much different. But when they went through that door, they had this understanding that, that they were going in and they were taking down someone who was allegedly violent and allegedly mentally ill. And again, I'm not suggesting that she wasn't mentally ill. As a historian, I would just like to see those records for myself. But of course, that's impossible. But of course, being mentally ill is not a crime. Being mentally ill no, it's not. is a medical problem, which should be treated that's as right. such. That's right. And unfortunately, like some victims that came before her, and even now, when you have people who are experiencing some type of mental health crisis, the police are always called. And nine times out of 10, when the police is called, you know, you could probably predict that that person is going to get hurt. And again, I'm not a police officer. I'm not a commissioner. I'm not a state rep. I don't make policy. But it seems to me there's a historical pattern with police 
and those who are mentally ill with those encounters tend to look like they're often deadly encounters. Um, And that was the case for Eleanor Bumpers. She should have never been evicted in the first place, in my opinion. And the eviction should have never been carried out by police officers. Yes, Eleanor Bumpers was killed in her home. Maybe she thought she was defending her home. At any rate, you write that the killing of Eleanor Bumpers illuminates how domestic spaces, entities once called home, become and continue to be contested terrains between Black women and police. That's right, because there's a sense that Number one, that black women should not defend themselves, that they have no right to defend themselves, their bodies or their children. And number two, there is the thinking that black women don't have the right to defend the spaces in which they take up, right, that they have no right to defend their homes. So black women are seen as these kind of dispossessed victims, if you will. Black women have no right to question authority. And that's what what she was really, in some sense, and again, I'm not saying that mental illness is not a factor in this. And I can't speak to her state of mind at that particular time. I can just probably imagine. But as an elderly woman behind the door, you hear this commotion outside and all of a sudden, 10 to 15 people are coming into the house. You are defensive. We also have to keep in mind that this is also a time during the 80s where, you know, elderly people, well, some of them were in positions where they were being accosted by folks within the, within the community. And again, these are not in large numbers. And I'm only saying this because Mary Bumpers, when I interviewed her, she informed me that they often told their mother not to open the door for anyone because there had been a few robberies in the building and she lived by herself. So that was one reason why she didn't open the door. But yes, I mean, there's this thinking that Black women, that they're violent, right? And that they shouldn't be protected, but that they should not protect themselves as well. When Eleanor Bumpers was killed in 1984, many Black activists pointed to her death as part of the story of the criminalization of a whole community, a whole people, which made everybody, including grandmothers, subject to police termination. Everyone related, everyone, this case resonated with everyone because Eleanor Bumpers was seen as everybody's grandmother. I mean, it's one thing if young black men and women, children are killed by the police. And we had seen that with Randy Evans of the 70s in New York and Donald Glover in the 70s in New York City. But for a 60-something-year-old grandmother who may have been experiencing a mental crisis. People believe that this was part of a long historic trend of police killings, but they also saw their own grandmothers within Eleanor Bumpers. That if this could happen to this elderly woman, then no one, nobody was safe. And it was amazing that they tied all of these cases together that this was part of a larger tradition of police violence against Black people. With the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen the ritual say her name or say his name, but you seem to be taking it even further. You're saying, tell the story, tell his or her story. Tell their story. And I believe that the Say Her Name campaign that movement is so needed, and I'm glad that activists continue to evoke the name of victims such as Eleanor Bumpers and others. But what I think potentially happens, at least in the case of Eleanor Bumpers, is that people, again, tend to focus on what happened to them. These shooting victims are frozen in time. And often what happens in the case of Eleanor Bumpers in particular is that When you freeze her in time, you confine her to one single event. Eleanor Bumpers had a lifetime, you know, of experiences. She had so many different socioeconomic and political possibilities. But when you freeze her in time to October 29, 1984, as 1551 Cedric Houses, 
the only thing that comes to mind is the violence. The other point about freezing someone in time is that oftentimes the details of the case are wrong. There's a lot of urban legends about people when we freeze them in time. And lastly, we need to complicate the narrative. We can't confine people to one singular narrative. She had many different narratives, right? What happened to her on October 29, 1984, is part of a larger lifetime of challenges that she faced, both externally and internally, right? And I think that once we study her life, we can kind of understand perhaps how she ended up in that particular housing project. How did she come to not opening the door for anyone who knocked on the door other than family, right? And I also think it's important to understand the context of the 80s. So I think that we have to definitely say her name, say their name, but we also have to tell their stories. We have to humanize them and see beyond the photos, see beyond the cell phone videos, see beyond the dash cams. And the last thing I'll say about that is it's also important to say her name, but also look at the impact of that violence on one's family. Because once the media, this case goes away, the media dies down, the family is left to still continue to mourn. So I was really interested in understanding the impact of the death, the community activism on that family. While we have moved on, the public has moved on, the family has not. So I think by going Further than saying her name, I think we get at some of those questions and some of those issues. That was author and professor of history, LaShawn Harris, speaking from Michigan State University. Deep in the countryside of Zambia in southern Africa, a man in his 60s called Gogo Breeze holds forth on one of the country's most popular radio shows. Harry England is a professor of social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. He's written a book titled Gogo Breeze, Zambia's Radio Elder and the Voice of Free Speech. We asked Professor England why an African elder with a radio show rates scholarly attention. Well, you see, radio is still the most important mass medium in that part of the world, and the power of the radio must not be underestimated. If something goes wrong in society and that uh, wrongdoing is actually broadcast on the radio, there is a good chance that uh, many people will hear about it, many people might get angry about it. So radio personality who is very popular, who has a following, is definitely wielding a great deal of power and influence. So I have in the book, Gogo Breeze, specific examples of how he has addressed various problems and grievances that people have presented to him, including uh, things to do with underpayment of salaries in a sort of agricultural enterprise that Chinese investors brought to the province. And he got the information that people were not, the workers were not paid they do salaries. So Zambia has legislation on minimum wage, as well as various other conditions were very poor on that estate. He investigated about the things and then together with these workers protests in the capital of this province, he actually helped change to take place. Of course, the change is not on a very large scale most of the time. This is a provincial radio station, one guy doing this kind of work. But there's never too much of this kind of intervention on ordinary people's behalf in poor parts of the world like Zambia. I have specific examples of that kind in the book where he has interfered. But also part of my argument is that also the fear of actually having to face this grandfather and his microphone does change the behavior amongst senior civil servants, for example, or, or other figures of authority, so that people are checking their behavior to an extent because of his presence in the province.
Zambia isn't a showcase of free speech. I know that a socialist newspaper has been shut down with some regularity there. Uh, mm. How does Gogo Breeze get away with whatever he gets away with? That's a very good point. I mean, also some other radio stations, especially when political climate is, is getting more tense before elections, have been closed down. Their licenses have been withdrawn. Gogo Breeze is very well known in the province. And I think that's one thing that I also describe in the book, how he has been able to cultivate very good relationships with various authorities in the capital of this particular province. I mean, he doesn't operate from the capital of Zambia, which is Lusaka, but this is really in the province, in eastern province, where people uh, usually know each other very well. So this is some sort of personal skill on his part to negotiate all the kind of contradictions and conflicts that there are. And I'm not saying that Gogo Breeze couldn't do more by way of criticizing, you know, the powers that be. He's not revolutionary by any means because, of course, his image on the radio is that of an elder, that of a grandfather. He uses that kind of family term, or kinship term, grandfather, which is go-go in the local language. So uh, he's not out there to uh, provide a major transformation in people's lives, but he is, in my argument, very clearly a factor for justice on the ground. And with skillful negotiation, he, at least so far, has been able to avoid the kind of political interference that many other radio stations or some other radio stations in Zambia and other newspapers have had to face. Yeah, you're saying that this local radio personality enjoys more respect than activists do in Zambia. Well, what's that say about the activists? Yeah, well, I want to be quite specific about the kinds of activists I have in mind. I mean, in Zambia, again, if you think of Lusaka, the capital itself, there are, of course, activists of all kinds. But I came to this conclusion also on the basis of my earlier work in Malawi and Zambia amongst human rights activists who have become a bit of a kind of professionalized class. They do very important work in the field of civil and political rights. For example, in Malawi, there was a move by political elites to get an unconstitutional third term for the state president some time ago. It is clear that human rights activists, along with church activists, were very important in putting an end to that. And there are many other examples of the good work. But however, also human rights activists in these countries have tended to be slightly elitist in their concerns. As I say, they have been mostly interested in political and civil freedoms, which are of course important area of human rights, but not perhaps the more core area that many poor people in Malawi or Zambia are particularly concerned about. So in my previous book called Prisoners of Freedom, I gave quite detailed descriptions of how human rights activists conduct themselves on the ground when they provide what they call civic education, people in villages, in communities, or when they translate from English language into local language these concepts of human rights. They don't consult people. They have a top-down approach most of the time. And in relation to that, then somebody like Gogo Breeze is a very different kind of actor he uses the local language, he loves the local language, he tries to uh, work with people in, on their own terms, and he definitely addresses questions to do with the material injustices that people face on a daily basis, rather than merely or simply the political and civil freedoms that have so much exercised human rights activists in these countries until recently at least. You seem to view Gogo Breeze as an example of liberal politics in action, liberal being a term that is in disrepute in many circles nowadays. Yeah, I'm glad you take that up because, again, as I said, there are bigger questions here that this provincial radio personality can help us to think. And really, the nature of liberal 
politics is one of them. I mean, this radio station where Gogo Breeze works owes its existence for once to the freedom of expression that, despite all the problems, has been in, in Zambia for a couple of decades now. And on the other hand, it's also a privately owned radio station, so it is operating in a market situation. It depends on revenue and so on. So this is a kind of liberal institution. But also the uh, ideas and the values that Gogo Breeze pursues are liberal in the sense that he is trying to help people to uh, realize their own life aspirations and he's not, despite his image as a grandfather, he's not trying to uh, put anybody down. He doesn't come across as a conservative uh, figure when you actually analyze in more detail how he operates and how he is able to adjust also his own opinions on things when he's challenged by women, for example. Or, or younger people. So there's a liberal kind of attitude to everything that he does, although the image is something that many people in Zambia can relate to, that is an elderly man, a grandfather figure, rather than uh, some youthful activist who uh, goes around telling everybody how ignorant they are. This is not Google Breeze's style. <laughs> And that's it for this edition of Black Agenda Radio. Be sure to visit us at blackagendareport.com, where you will find a new and provocative issue each Wednesday. That's www.blackagendareport.com. It's the place for news, commentary, and analysis from the black left. I'm Nellie Bailey, along with my co-host, Glenn Ford. Our thanks to the good people at the Progressive Radio Network. 